Hello Palominos, this is Mrs. Rodriguez with this week's read aloud of the book Twerk. And so what I'm going to be doing is every week I'm going to be reading a few chapters from this book and then have a few discussion question or maybe just one discuss discussion question under the link and have, you guys can have an opportunity to comment on what you thought about this week's reading and um or and to answer the question but the book twerp is about a good kid who made a bad mistake and an unforgettable story and i thought it would be a good uh choice because we have a lot of our new sixth graders who are transitioning to middle school and you're going to be uh, seeing that you're going to encounter some opportunities to have to make a decision because you're a little bit more independent and how important it is to really think about what your choice is in making that decision and maybe learning from our character named Julian who is also a sixth grader who is starting middle school. So I'm going to go ahead and begin reading the book Twerp and this is written by Mark Goldblatt. Chapter one, The Pigeons of Ponzini, Julian Twersky, January 11th, 1969. So this already tells us that this takes place, if we're talking about 1969, we're talking about um, a 45 years ago, a long time ago, maybe 50 years ago. My English teacher, Mr. Scout, Mr. Selkirk said, I have to write something and it has to be long on account of the thing that happened over winter recess, which in my opinion, doesn't amount to much. It's not like I meant for Danley to get hurt. I don't think that what happened was 100% my fault or even a lot my fault, even though I don't deny that I was there. So I guess I deserve to get suspended like the rest of them. I mean, maybe I could have stopped it, maybe, but now the suspension is over and Selkirk says, I've got to write something. And because he says so, my dad says so, and that's that. I know what's going on. Selkirk thinks that if I write about what happened, I'll understand what happened, which makes no sense of, at all if you stop to think about it, because if I don't understand what happened, how can I write about it? Besides, I've done much worse and never written a word about it, and the fact that I never wrote about it had no effect good or bad. So writing about it or not writing about it isn't gonna prove a thing. I've got a good handle on who I am, if I can say so myself. Compared with most 12 year olds, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm done growing up. I know I've got a long way to go. Sixth grade isn't the end of the line. My dad says that when he looks back to when he was a kid, he doesn't know whether to laugh or cry. I know there's going to be a Julian Tversky in the future who's going to look back the same way and maybe shake his head. That last sentence should make you happy, Mr. Selkirk. But when I look back right now, I'm just saying that what happened with Dan Lee Dimmel isn't the worst thing I've done. I'll give you a perfect example. Last year, Lonnie and I were out back in Ponzini doing nothing just yakking it up. Now I guess I should mention that Lonnie's my best friend, except calling him my best friend doesn't tell how tight we are. My dad says that if Lonnie told me to jump, I'd ask how high. He's being sarcastic, my dad, but he's right in a way, because here's the thing, Lonnie wouldn't tell me to jump unless I had a good reason to. So yeah, I'd ask how high and he'd ask me how high too, if I told him to jump. It doesn't mean a thing. I've known Lonnie since I was two and he was three. And some of the stuff that's gone on between the two of us, he'd brain me if I wrote about it. But I'm sure he'll be all right with me writing about the thing with the bird. So I don't know if you guys have ever had friends like that where you just influence each other, right? If he says something, then you'll do it. Or if you say something, your friend will do it. But I've seen a lot of those friendships here at Nicolette. Oh, and I should also mention that Ponzini 
is what we call the lot behind the old apartment building on Parsons Boulevard, where Victor Ponzini lives. Why we started calling it Ponzini is another story. And it doesn't matter for the bird story. Let's just say that Lonnie was the first to call it that. And it caught on with the rest of us. But it fits. It looks like a Ponzini kind of place. If you want to picture it, picture a layer of brown dirt on a layer of gray cement about the size of a basketball court. It, it's got weeds growing out of it and it's got broken gr glass around the edges and it's got a half a dozen rusted out wrecks that were once parked in the underground garage but got pushed out back when their owners skipped town. It's got rats, which should go without saying but the rats only come out at night. In other words, it's foul and useless, kind of like Victor Ponzini, who once squealed on Lonnie for cutting class. I mean, why is, a Ponzini, why is that Ponzini's business? The guy's a fifth grader and nothing but a tub of lard, but at least he knows it, which is about the only thing he's got going for himself. So, so far, listening to the way Julian is talking, he uh, doesn't seem to be like a very nice kid, the way he's talking about other people. And uh, I don't know if you guys have a place around here like that in Banning, but it sounds like they have a little hangout spot that they like to go to. So something happened there with birds. Let's see if we can find out what happened there with the, pigeon, with the pigeons. So Lonnie and I were hanging out at the far end of Ponzini just shooting the breeze when I noticed that about a dozen pigeons had landed between two of the rusted out wrecks. I nodded at the birds and Lonnie glanced, at, glanced behind them. And I said, what do you make of that? But in the time it took for the words to come out of my mouth, another half dozen pigeons swooped down and landed. It was crazy, like a scene from that Alfred Hitchcock movie where there are a million birds get together and attack a town for no reason. There was no reason for them to show up in Ponzini either. There's not a thing for them to eat. I mean, it might make sense if someone had scattered breadcrumbs for them, but there was nothing. It was as if one pigeon took it into its head that the far end of Ponzini would be a good place to rest for a minute. And then the entire Air Force joined in. So they're sitting there and all of a sudden, all these pigeons came and just landed right in front of them. There's no food, no reason. So they're just kind of looking, checking it out. Why are all these pigeons here? So the two of us were standing there watching. And in about a minute, there were hundreds of pigeons crammed together between the two rusted out wrecks. And the air was full of plurks. You know that that sound that pigeons make? <laughs> My computer made that sound at the same time, so maybe that was the little sound effect. Their heads were bopping up and down, ducking back and forth, and they were checking each other out. It was like a bird carnival. I'd never seen anything like it. That's when Lonnie turned to me and said, chuck a rock. I stared at him. It made no sense. What do you mean? I mean chuck a rock. He said, why would I chuck a rock? He gave a slight laugh. Come on, Julian, chuck a rock. I'm not chucking a rock, you chuck a rock. Don't you want to see him take off at once? Well, I might hit one of them, I said. You're not gonna hit one of them. How do you know? Plus, even if you do, they're pigeons, they're filthy. I'm not chucking a rock. Come on, he said. It'll be like a science experiment. How do you get that, I said. You think you'll hit one of them. I think you won't hit one of them. It's like you got a hypothesis and I got a hypothesis. And now we're gonna do a science experiment to see which one is right. I don't know about you, but I don't think that qualifies as a science experiment. Ask your science teacher, but. I would say they would say no. You just want to see them take off at once. I never denied that, he said. I'm just saying it's also science. Then why don't you do it? First of all, 
because you got a stronger arm than I do. So you can chuck the rock higher, which will give them more time to take off. And second of all, because it was my idea and I want to watch them take off at once. The sky is gonna be full of pigeons and I wanna watch the thing from start to finish. You don't think I'm gonna hit one of them? There's no way you're gonna hit one of them, Lonnie said. It's like survival of the fittest. Use your brain, Julian. Do you think the pigeon's gonna, pigeon makes it even one week in this neighborhood if he can't dodge a rock? He had me there. I'd seen hundreds of dead pigeons before. Pigeons that got run over by cars, pigeons that got caught and chewed up by dogs and cats, pigeons that got electrocuted on the power lines, pigeons that froze on the tree branches and then dropped to the sidewalk, still iced over. But none of them, as far as I know, ever got beamed by a rock. I bent down and picked up a rock. It was gray with streaks of black running through it. Maybe the size of a recess cup, that big. Except kind of jagged and heavier. The weight of it in my hand gave me a second thought. I knew that if I hit one of the birds, it was going to hurt it bad. But then I thought that Lonnie was likely right. The pigeons would see the rock coming and they'd all take off at once. And it would be something to see. So I did it. I chucked the rock. I knew it was a dumb thing to do, but I did it. Which now that I think about it, kind of makes my dad's point about Lonnie telling me to jump except it had gotten to where I wanted to chuck the rock, even though I knew it was dumb because I wanted to see what would happen. Just to make sure though, I screamed, heads up birds, real loud, a second before I chucked it. And then I chucked it as high as I could. And the rock was no sooner in the air than the sky was full of birds wave after wave of them taking off before the rock even got to its highest point. There were so many of them in the air that it was hard to follow the upward flight of the rock because it was just another gray and black thing. But you could follow it on the way down. It was the only thing going in that direction. And that was when I realized that the lots of birds were still going to be on the ground when it hit. They were crammed together too tight. There was no more room in the air for the stragglers to take off and no space on the ground for them to get away. It was maybe a second between the time I realized that the time the rock hit, but that was one long second. My mind was racing forward and I was grabbing at the air, clenching and unclenching my right hand as if that would bring the rock back, as if I could undo how dumb I was for chucking it in the first place. Meanwhile, I was still hoping, no, I was praying that the rock would just clack down on the ground and nothing would happen. But when the rock hit and the sound wasn't a clack, but a soft oof, and I knew from the sound, I'd hit a bird. I couldn't tell which one for another couple seconds. That was how long it took for the rest of the birds to scatter and take off. And then there was only one left on the ground, flapping its wings like crazy, but just going around in circles and raising a cloud of dust. Holy, Lonnie said, Oh no, oh God, you said they'd get out of the way. That was my hypothesis. I ran over to the bird for a closer look. The poor thing was spinning around and around, getting nowhere. It wasn't bleeding, at least not that I could see. I thought for sure the rock had gashed it or split its skull wide open, but it looked kind of okay, except for the crazy way it was flapping its wings. Maybe it just needed to calm down for a minute and figure out it wasn't hurt too bad. Come on, Lonnie said to me in a whisper. Let's get out of here. No, wait. 
Let's cheese it, Julian. It's over and done with it. No. Lonnie came up behind me and the two of us stared for about a minute as a pigeon began to tire itself out. It went from flapping around in a circle to hopping side to side to walking back and forth to standing still with its head bopping up and down. Then it just stopped. It just sank to the ground and sat there. There, you see, Lonnie? Or, there, you see, Lonnie said. It's going to be just fine. I took a step toward the pigeon. It stood up and walked a couple of bird steps away from me, then settled back down. I took another step, and so did the pigeon. I don't think it can fly, he said. Sure it can, watch. Lonnie stepped in front of me and lurched at the pigeon. It fluttered its wings for a second, but moved about six inches. Then he stamped his foot on the floor. This time, the pigeon didn't react, except to turn his head away as if he wasn't interested in what happened next. Lonnie said, that's one messed up pigeon. What are we going to do? He shrugged. Cheese it? Cheese it. I've never heard of that. I think that means get out of there. No, a cat's going to get it. Then there's only one thing left to do. What? You've got to put it out of its misery. Kill it? That's what you've got to do if it's dying. But we don't know for sure it's dying. Then let's get out of here. But, Julian, it's got to be one or the other. Lonnie stepped past the pigeon and picked up the rock, the one I chucked, which was laying about a foot away. As soon as he picked it up, I closed my eyes real tight. I didn't want to see what he was about to do. But then a second later, I felt him put the rock in my hand. I opened my eyes and saw it there. Oh no, you have to do it, Julian. Why do I have to do it? Because you're the one who chucked the rock. But it was your idea. But I didn't chuck it. But it was your idea. But I didn't chuck it. Come on, Lonnie. Look, we can go back and forth forever. So I'm just gonna tell you, I'm not killing that bird.